The enticing and multi-layered man that leads Mindhunter, played by Jonathan Groff, is Holden Ford, based on former FBI agent John E. Douglas, the author of Mindhunter inside the FBI's elite special crime unit. Douglas is one of the leading experts on serial killers in the United States who founded the Criminal Profiling Program at the FBI's Behavioral Sciences Unit. In Mindhunter, Ford is guided by another man, Bill Tent, an ex-Army FBI veteran. This character is based off of Robert K. Ressler, a former FBI agent who was also a prominent figure in the Behavioral Sciences Unit. Like in Mindhunter, he was credited with being the man who coined the term serial killer. These two men interviewed dozens of the world's most prolific serial killers that ever walked the earth, learning from them and gaining insight into their psychology. Though Mindhunter uses non-true-to-life character names for these two men, done so to clearly draw a line between what is fictional and what is factual, the serial killers featured in the show were and are very much real people. The most prominent killer that defines the first season of Mindhunter is the co-ed killer, aka Ed Kemper. The 6 foot 9, 250 pound Kemper is brilliantly played in the show by Cameron Britton. Seeing the two side by side, the Kemper we know from Mindhunter is extremely close to the real man. In fact, there are numerous direct quotes coming from an in-prison interview with the killer featured in the show. I knew a week before she died I was going to kill her. I knew a week before she died I was going to kill her. She, went, she out went out to, to a party, she, she got, got soused. soused, she, she came, came home, home alone. I was woken up by that, I got came out. You know that night I, I walked up, up to her bed, bed. She's, she's laying, laying there reading a paperback. paperback. As many, many thousands, thousands of nights before. before. She says, Boy, I suppose you're going to want to wait up all, up all night, night and talk now. now. Kemper's life of killing began at an extremely young age of just 15 years old. At the time, he lived with his grandparents, and on August 27th of 1974, after his grandfather had left to get groceries, Kemper got into an argument with his grandmother and ultimately wound up shooting her to quote, see what it felt like. He then waited for his grandfather to come back home. When he saw his grandfather coming, he quickly went outside to meet him in the driveway and shot him as well, later claiming that he had killed his grandfather only so that he wouldn't have to see that his wife had been murdered. He then called police and was placed into a mental hospital. Nonetheless, he had found a taste for murder. Six years later, he convinced authorities that he was fit to leave and was let out at 21. Though, as he claims in the show, he was still a disturbed young man. He lived a secluded life with his mother, who constantly put him down. This in part led Camper down a dark path. From May of 1972 to April of 1973, Kemper murdered a high school student and five co-eds over the course of just a year, often simply in spite of his mother, and over time he would go on to plan killing her as well. On April 20th of 1973, after waiting for her to fall asleep, he gruesomely murdered and mutilated her. He then called her best friend to come over and killed her as well. This would be the finale to his murderous spree. He wound up calling police and admitted to being the co-ed killer. The real life Ford, John Douglas, has claimed that Kemper was among the brightest people he had ever interviewed. Today, he is nearly 70 years old and is considered to be a model prisoner. Kemper's most recent parole hearing was actually this year, but interestingly, since 1985 he has actually turned down every potential parole hearing claiming that he is unfit for society. Though Mindhunter features primarily serial killers, we are also introduced to a man named Richard Speck in episode 9. He is the epitome of someone who simply doesn't care about a thing. In the show, we see Speck as a clearly disturbed and deranged monster. In one of the most memorable scenes of the show, Ford, attempting a new tactic, lowers himself to Speck's level, ultimately putting his career in jeopardy. While not a serial killer based on his convictions, the real Richard Speck is infamous for his horrific killings committed in just one night. However, it is speculated that he may have been killing for years in Indiana and Michigan for murders that at times he was even a suspect of, but simply was always able to find a way out of. On July 13th of 1966, he broke into the home of nine student nurses of the South Chicago Community Hospital. Though he had committed violent acts before, this night was unimaginably gruesome. He tied them up, forced them all into separate rooms, and then individually entered the rooms torturing them, raping them, and killing them. He committed a shocking eight murders that night. 
However, you may remember that there had been nine nurses to begin with. He seemingly had lost count as one sole woman was able to hide under a bed until he left unharmed. She was able to escape to tell her stories, and the horrific night made headlines around the world. She was also able to remember one very distinct thing about Speck. He had a tattoo on his left arm that read, Born to Raise Hell. This is mentioned in the show when Ford, seeing an opportunity to get Speck to open up, claims to be a fan of his and wanted to see his infamous tattoo. Speck was arrested and convicted of the torture, rape, and murder on eight accounts. He would go on to spend 25 years behind bars before dying of a heart attack in 1991. These tapes released after he had died showed him in this unusual altercation, displaying the illegal activities that went on behind bars. It caused outrage that a man like him was able to lead the life he wanted while paying for his crimes. As the show goes on, we begin to see the same ADT security services man from Wichita, Kansas in these short snippet intros. It is never fully explained who he is or what his correlation to the show really is. We do get the sense that he is a future killer and one that is progressing on his urges, slowly getting more confident. Though he hasn't killed anyone yet, again it is safe to assume that he will become a future serial killer and an emphasis on this character leads me to believe that he will become a major part of the show in future future seasons. This mysterious man is actually Dennis Rader, aka the BTK killer. Dennis Rader was an Air Force vet and the president of his church board. However, despite seemingly being as average as they come, he was secretly a very troubled man. He killed a total of eight women and two men in Kansas. He would break into his victims' homes and act as if he was at his own home waiting for his victims to arrive. When they would come home, he would tie them up, torture them, and eventually murder them. Most chillingly though is that he would often put on this mask wear his victim's clothing and then pose as his victims while taking pictures of himself tied up, reenacting their deaths. He became one of the most popular and prolific serial killers in American history. He was extremely elusive and grew so confident in his killing that he began sending letters, drawn photos, and even once sent a doll to law enforcement, taunting them and signing off as BTK. The name is one that he gave himself, an abbreviation for Bind, Torture, Kill. The final scene from the first season of Mindhunter is given to the BTK killer, indicating that we will likely see a lot more of him in season 2. However, it could take multiple seasons before he is ever captured, if he is ever captured at all. The show is still in the 1970s, and the BTK killer was not captured until 2005. The interviews of the various serial killers shown in Mindhunter actually played a large role in the FBI finally tracking down Raider in real life. Today, Dennis Rader is in his 70s and is serving 10 consecutive life sentences. <laughs> oh, Norton got a lot of shots in. But still, that was something. It is not an easy thing to break a human being's jaw. Let me assure you, that takes practice. <laughs> in episodes 7 and 8, we are introduced to a new prisoner by the name of Jerome Rudos. We are quickly shown that he is clearly a very dominant and frightening person. The character in the show played by Happy Anderson is quite close to who the real Brutos was. Brutos, like many serial killers, grew up with a hatred towards his mother who would often belittle him, abuse him, and tell him that she had wished he was a girl. This led to an extreme hatred towards women in general. A necrophile with a shoe fetish, Brutus was just 17 when he first abducted and beat a young woman named Linda Slauson. He was subsequently placed into a psychiatric ward in Oregon State Hospital for nearly a year. After this, he went on to live a seemingly normal life, getting married to Ralphine Brutos and having two children. He was living a double life. During the day, he was a married father of two, but during the night, he was strangling and killing young women for sexual gratification for years. 
His chain of murders began in 1968, killing anywhere from four to seven women during the late 60s in Oregon. As authorities were looking for this deranged killer, the press labeled him the Lust Killer and also the Shoe Fetish Slayer. Disturbingly, he would dress up as a woman when he was abducting, killing, and mutilating his victims, seemingly because this is what his mom had always wanted him to be. Horrifically, he would often keep body parts of his victims as a trophy. Police finally caught up with Brutos in 1969, and after a series of tests and interviews, he was deemed to not be criminally insane. What was learned from Brutos' interviews would become incredibly important to the research of the FBI during the late 1970s. He gave an insight into the criminal's mind that was unique to many others. In 2006, after 37 years behind bars, Brutos died of liver cancer. Yeah, I've, I've gone a lot of places and done a lot of things. I'm assuming that I never hurt anybody because I never got any complaints from anybody. Virginia State Penitentiary, Monty Ralph Rissell. In episode four, we see Ford and Tench waiting to speak to a man introduced to us as Monty Rissell. Though he agrees to speak to them, it is clear that he isn't interested in being compliant. This due to his seemingly uninterested and even agitated behavior throughout the interview. It also becomes clear that not all serial killers will be as interested in talking to cops as Kemper is. The real Monty Rissell is one of the lesser known serial killers. He had a tough childhood and had a resentment for his mother who had left his father at a very young age. At just 12 years old, the angry young man had already committed his first burglary. Only two years later, he was arrested for stealing a car and raping his neighbor at knife point. This ultimately led to Rissell spending large amounts of time in institutions. However, he was able to convince counselors that he was making progress all the while committing horrible crimes while on short leave. After receiving a letter from his girlfriend breaking up with him, he drove to her college to spy on her and saw that she had a new boyfriend. This sent him over the edge with an extreme hatred for women. Sitting in his car late that night, a car pulled into the same parking lot driven by a single woman. In the spur of the moment, he attacked her at gunpoint, forced her to drive to a secluded area near a river and raped her. However, by chance, she happened to be a prostitute, and though she was likely scared, according to Rissell, she wasn't afraid to have sex with him and actually asked him how he liked it. This drove him mad. He says it was like she was trying to control the situation. She also had pretended to enjoy it, further enforcing his feelings that all women were whores. After attempting to escape, he began to choke her, smashed her head against a rock, and held her underwater, killing her. He went on to kill four more women and raped at least 12, all by the age of just 19, again, all the while convincing his counselors that he was actually progressing. In 1977, he was incarcerated and is serving multiple life sentences today. All this stuff on my mind, and it just seemed like something snapped at me. I mean, she was just unfortunate that, that I was there and she came home, you know. 